Hi everyone. I'm excited to be talking to you today about methods for decentralized phylogenetic analyses in evolutionary computation. My name is Matthew. I'm a postdoc at the University of Michigan in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and Complex Systems Departments. Uh, let's just get into it. So phylogenetics refers to the structure of hereditary relationships within an evolving system. This is kind of along the lines of the tree of life uh, tracing the history of organisms in an evolving system. Phylogenetic analyses provide a really powerful window into evolutionary systems. Of course, you can use them to kind of get a play-by-play -play of the particular history of an evolutionary uh, run and to kind of uh, track the route that different traits arose. However, you can also use uh, in kind of a more general way to, in principle, detect the presence of ecological dynamics within the system, uh, detect selection pressure, and other evolutionary dynamics. And of particular interest to the GP community, um, there is exciting new work uh, looking at ways to apply phylogenetic information in kind of in real time to help direct evolutionary algorithms. So as you might expect, there is a really rich history of phylogenetic analyses in uh, digital evolution and evolutionary computation. However, these analyses have been performed in a, under kind of a perfect tracking model. Under this model, every reproduction event within a system is logged, and then you can kind of stitch all those together in order to perfectly reconstruct the uh, phylogenetic history of the system. And this works really well uh, for uh, single processor experiments, but when you scale up to larger experiments, um, uh, running in distributed and parallel contexts on many processors, this perfect tracking paradigm becomes really complicated and difficult and uh, inefficient. Uh, some issues being the fragility to uh, lost data, which is kind of an inevitability as systems scale up, and um, the need to uh, have knowledge of extinction events in order to prune back the uh, phylogeny so that the amount of information being stored doesn't uh, grow um, excessively. So. In order to extend phylogenetic analyses in a more tractable way to these multiprocessor systems, we're really interested in uh, taking advantage of inspiration from the amazing success that evolutionary biologists working with natural systems have had in uh, performing phylogenetic reconstructions through a post hoc inference um, kind of paradigm instead of, a, a, of course, a tracking paradigm. So this is kind of the idea of uh, looking at phylogenetics by grabbing a set of genomes that are extant in your system and doing some inference to reconstruct an estimate of their, the phylogenetic relationship between these organisms. This raises an interesting engineering question though, which is how to best design these genomes in order to maximize the accuracy and efficiency with which we can perform these phylogenetic reconstructions. And so um, this research project has led to the development of new methodology, which I'll be talking about today. And what I really want to emphasize is um, a really key component of this project is the development of plug-and-play software tools so that these types of techniques can be applied across all kinds of evolutionary com computing systems that are moving to uh, distributed and parallel uh, evaluation. So the main point of this talk is to communicate the capabilities of this methodology um, with a particular focus on sexual populations. Uh, we'll be talking about how you can use um, the developed methodology, which we call hereditary stratigraphy, to reconstruct, of course, phylogenetic history from a EC run, to, and then also to estimate the population sizes at different points in that history, and to detect um, selection within the system. And in the interest of time, I'll also be including some kind of information about how this works under the hood and some results verifying uh, the methodology, uh, but these are kind of fast forward or cut out a little bit in the interest of time. So uh, feel free to follow up um, uh, with me by email or uh, to comment um, if, if you'd like more detail on this. And of course, you can all also find the full uh, manuscript in the uh, GPTP proceedings from 2023. So let's start by talking about how uh, how we can perform a reconstruction on an asexual population. So the goal here is to grab the set of genomes that are extant at the end of a run so we don't have access to any of the information, um, uh, any of the genomes directly um, uh, that uh, preceded them. And the goal is to do some inference and to estimate their phylogenetic relationship. 
And so how we go about this is um, taking genomes in our system and tacking on a little annotation that is phenotypically neutral to the genome. And then um, this annotation is inherited when the genome reproduces. And we ins uh, enforce a process where every time the annotation is duplicated, a new little random fingerprint, a little packet of data, is attached to the end of the annotation. And as we continue this process, you can see more fingerprints being deposited. And you can see um, the idea being that we can line up these fingerprints. And in places where they mismatch, we can um, deduce that shared uh, ancestry um, the shared ancestry is no longer the case, that these lineages diverged at that point. And so we can map that into our phylogenetic reconstruction. So in order to make this work in practice, we need to figure out how to deal with a uh, kind of a crucial issue, which is preventing the genetic annotations from exploding in size. So um, as generations elapse, if we don't do anything, these annotations are going to grow and grow and grow as we append new fingerprints. So. The solution to this is to uh, perform pruning on the fingerprints, to throw some of them away, which introduces a trade-off between the accuracy and the resolution to which we can reconstruct phylogenetic events um, and the space that these annotations are taking up. And so there's a lot more um, to this pruning process. This is really the subtle and interesting part of the methodology. Um, and there's different trade-offs you can make to have constant size annotations, annotations that grow uh, logarithmically with uh, with the number of generations that have elapsed, um, but uh, we're going to gloss over that a little bit in the interest of time. So here's an example reconstruction from an asexual population that we were able to perform using uh, this um, hereditary stratigraphy methodology. On the left is the uh, perfectly tracked uh, phylogeny, and on the right is the reconstruction. Uh, for this experiment, we ran 250,000 generations with a population size of about 30,000 and uh, the annotations were about 68 bytes per genome. However, you can get reasonable quality uh, reconstructions from annotations as small as around 256 bits. So this, pro this annotation scheme can be really lightweight um, and efficient. <laughs> All right, so we've figured out how we want to work with an asexual population. How do we extend this to work with sexual populations where instead of having one parent, each offspring has two parents, and it creates this uh, reticulated, di directed acyclic graph structure. So uh, the mechanism that we're proposing is to make this work as an inheritance rule where every time that um, an offspring is produced, you look at the annotation from both of its parents and compare the fingerprints at each layer, and you, the offspring will inherit the larger, in, uh, the larger of the two fingerprints, um, interpreting the fingerprints as an integer. So um, under the scheme, this kind of works like gene drive, where the largest uh, fingerprint that was generated will very quickly sweep the entire population, providing a consistent label uh, for that population. And you can see um, here we have a divergence event where the population splits in two, and these fingerprints are going to sweep into these subpopulations, and then we'll be able to differentiate the subpopulations in order to perform our reconstruction. So here's an example of phylogenetic reconstruction from a sexual population. Uh, we ran it for 200 generations. At 100 generations, as you can see here, we split the population in two, and then we split the population again at 150 generations into uh, five um, different subpopulations. So we only split the second population on the bottom branch here. And uh, because to make this visualization trackable, we subsampled the, uh, the leaves that are included here. And so um, we didn't include, we happened to not include a leaf from that fifth subpopulation. But you can see that secondary split also being reconstructed here. So it turns out that there's a little bit more information that we can pull out um, under this her, uh, inheritance scheme that we've proposed, which is that we can actually get an estimate of population sizes along um, a lineage of any individual um, in the extant population. So what we would want to do here is we want to be able to tell that the population size was relatively larger before the uh, split the speciation event, and then to be able to show kind of that um, the population size decreased after that split in this particular example. So how we can get at this is by thinking about the generation of the fingerprint that fixes as being drawn from a uh, number of um, random uh, samples that uh, is equivalent, of course, to the population size. And so the idea being the larger the population size, the more chances we're going to have to draw a really big 
fingerprints. And so on net, the fingerprints that fix in large populations are going to be bigger than the ones that fix in smaller populations. And so this can give us a, uh, within orders of magnitude, this can give us an estimate of the um, population size. So here we can see uh, an estimate where we were able to detect a bottleneck event um, that uh, where the population was dropped from 100 down to 10 and then reconstituted back up to 100 um, in, the, in the, the last part of the run here. The final thing we'd like to be able to do is to detect gene level selection events. Um, and this is a little bit tricky because it's not enough to just detect that a gene increases in frequency. We need to be able to say something about how fast that occurs because under random drift, we do expect genes to stochastically increase in frequency and eventually fix in the population. And so in order to differentiate that um, from selection events where um, due to uh, fitness advantage, a gene increases in uh, its copy count very quickly, um, as shown on the top here um, in this molar plot, we need to, um, we need to measure the, the rate of the copy count increase. And so uh, what we propose is very briefly uh, a distributed copy, a delayed distributed copy count estimation scheme where basically um, we take for, for each gene at a certain point in time in the population, for each allele of a gene um, at a certain time in the population, we run the, the clock forward 16 generations and then we take a snapshot that estimates the number of copies of that gene that are present in the population. Um, in this case, you know, 16 generations um, since. Uh, and that will allow us to differentiate genes that are increasing due to drift from those that are being actively selected for. And so very briefly, uh, kind of what the signal from this system looks like. So you can see here we introduced a new allele um, uh, that had a selective advantage at generation 50, and it increased in frequency uh, very quickly, sweeping the population going from uh, you know just one copy up to 400 copies in this particular population. And if we look at our dis uh, delayed copy count um, mechanism, we can see a really clear signal uh, coincident with that selection event um, being able to see that uh, that copy count of that gene is going up really fast at that particular point in time. So just to summarize here, uh, we introduced a scheme for phylogenetic analysis and inference over uh, distributed uh, evolutionary comput computation uh, populations. And this scheme is uh, completely system agnostic, where you can attach it just as an annotation onto uh, whatever it is that you're evolving. Um, and we demonstrated, we talked about uh, three different capabilities of the system, the ability to reconstruct phylogenetic history, including in sexual systems, the ability to estimate population sizes across um, the history of any extant individual, and the ability to detect gene level selection events by um, annotating individual genes. And so uh, this methodology has accompanying libraries that are aimed at kind of being able to be taken off the shelf and plugged into systems. Uh, there's a Python library currently, and there's going to be a C++ and maybe a Rust library soon. And uh, I'd also be really interested in collaborating with people who uh, see applications of this to their own system. So uh, be sure to reach out. Um, I'd really love to, to hear from folks. All right, I'll go ahead and acknowledge um, uh, collaborators um, who have uh, I've worked with on the overall development of the hereditary stratigraphy uh, methodology, um, the real-life Miss Frizzle, uh, Dr. Emily Dolson at Michigan State University, and one of our undergraduate students also at Michigan State University, uh, Santiago. And I'll also like to thank my uh, uh, doctoral and postdoctoral advisors, uh, Dr. Charles O'Free and Dr. Louise Simon, uh, for their support. All right, uh, with that, I think we're wrapped up here. Here's the URL for the library uh, implementation of this methodology. Uh, and please do reach out to me. Uh, I'd love to chat, um, comment here with any questions, shoot me an email. I'm easy to Google, Matthew Andres Moreno, uh, or you can find me on.